Hello, and welcome to Episode 7 of my Leaders of the American Civil War podcast. In this episode, we're going to continue our discussion of George Armstrong Custer. In review, uh, as of the last episode, we finished up in June of 1863. Robert E. Lee and the now powerful Army of Northern Virginia was snaking its way through the Shenandoah Valley, through Maryland, and into Pennsylvania. Fighting Joe Hooker was commander of the Union Army of the Potomac, and the army was idle, because Hooker had no idea what to do about the rebels who were now threatening Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and possibly Washington itself. Lincoln had no choice but to sack Hooker and replace him immediately with General George Meade. Now, in the meantime, General Pleasanton had been promoted to commander of the Army, uh, Army's Cavalry Corps, and Pleasanton, under pressure to, to improve the performance of the Union ca- Cavalry, sacked many of the brigade commanders who had been political appointees and promoted Custer to Brigadier General. From Glory Road by Bruce Catton, we read the following. Pleasanton had a cavalry now, a stylish little soldier with a perch straw hat and kid gloves and a shifty eye. And he was more of a cavalryman than Stoneman had been, though he was a long way from being Phil Sheridan. Pleasanton had some good subordinates, too, most notably a brigadier named John Buford, a solid man who was hard to frighten. There were others, Harem Scarum Judson Kilpatrick, for instance, a lanky little man with stringy side whiskers and a flamboyant hell-for-leather horseman named George Armstrong Custer, who possessed the great basic virtue of liking to fight. All in all, the Cavalry Corps now was a different outfit from the clumsy, lumbering conglomeration which had been wearing out good horses on Virginia's roads earlier in the war. Now both armies were on their way to Pennsylvania for the colossal showdown at Gettysburg. But just before this time, Custer had been lobbying for Michigan Governor Blair to appoint him colonel of a regiment of Michigan cavalry. But he wasn't taken too seriously because of his age and also because of his Democrat Party background. Now General Pleasanton had just been promoted had just promoted him to Brigadier General General, which meant he was given command of a brigade of cavalry of all four Michigan regiments. They were comprised of the 1st, the 5th, the 6th, and the 7th Michigan cavalry regiments. The man who was too young to command the regiment now had four regiments under his control, and he would immediately put them to good use. Okay, Custer must have had an inkling that his promotion to Brigadier General was in the offing because he came ready-made with a storage trunk with uh, a new uniform he was ready to put on right away. It included a broad-brimmed, low-crowned felt hat that was tilted to one side, and this was above his long, curly blonde hair with drooping mustache and a tuft of hair beneath his lower lip. He wore a black velveteen jacket with gold piping, It was double-breasted with eight buttons on each side. Under that, he wore a blue sailor's shirt, and he wore a bright necktie, which many of bright red necktie, which many of his troopers began to imitate over time. He wore dark pants that were tucked into high cavalry boots with gilt spurs. Some say say he looked like a circus rider gone mad, but he could be seen by all of his men on the field as well as the Confederates. In fact, he was so flashy that some uh, mistook him for a Confederate on the battlefield. He wanted attention, but he also uh, wanted his command and control uh, to know that he was on the field and he was in charge. At Hanover, Pennsylvania, he had his first experience as a brigade commander. Just before the Battle of Gettysburg, Jeb Stuart the uh, Confederate cavalry commander had gotten permission from Robert E. Lee to take his vaunted cavalry and make another wide sweeping circle around the Union Army. He had done this with great success one year earlier. The idea was to gather intelligence, threaten supply lines, and sow terror in the hearts of Washington, D.C. residents, which included Presidents Lincoln and Secretary of State uh, Stanton. It was also a diversionary tactic to keep eyes on Stuart 
while Lee was making his way up to, to invade Pennsylvania. Stuart also had an ulterior motive, having just been surprised at, at Brandy Station by the uh, Yankee cavalry. He was getting hammered in the press uh, by the Confederate newspapers, and he wanted to redeem his reputation. However, the Union cavalry was, was now much improved, and their confidence was on the rise. They didn't know exactly what Jeb Stuart was doing, but they weren't going to cower away from him and let him just maneuver without a fight which Custer demonstrated uh, at at Hanover, Pennsylvania. In his first moment as a new brigade commander, he was not leading a wild charge, but instead used new techniques and technology to win this battle. He made use of the Spencer repeating rifles and the artillery to stop uh, Stuart's rebel cavalry in their tracks. When Custer heard gunfire from uh, approaching rebels coming from their rear in Hanover, He had them dismount and form a skirmish line, which opened fire on rebel cavalry and forced them to backtrack and go further east towards York, Pennsylvania. What this did was to keep the rebel cavalry away from Robert E. Lee's infantry long enough, or much longer than expected, and Stuart was never able to play a screening and intelligence gathering role expected of him, which which put Lee at a disadvantage prior to the Battle of Gettysburg. Okay, day three of Gettysburg. The battle was about to hit its apex with Pickett's charge on July the 3rd. The far right flank of the Union Army was being protected by Judson Kilpatrick's cavalry division, which included Custer's brigade. Lee had sent Jeb Stewart's cavalry behind the Union position to, to disrupt their communication lines and cut off their retreat in advance of his attack on Cemetery Hill. From Custer's Trials by T.J. Stiles, we have the following. Unknown to Custer, Lee had decided to win the Battle of Gettysburg with a decisive thrust at the center of the Union line. He had called on General Stewart to take his much-admired horsemen and swing around the Union right flank in a solid mass. He was to get into the rear of the Union infantry during the frontal assault and pursue and destroy the retreating foe. The Michigan Brigade was the last obstacle in his way. Now, Custer defied an order from General Kilpatrick to leave the area when General Gregg asked him to stay and help him fight off Stuart and the Rebel Cavalry. This area of Gettysburg is now called East Cavalry Field because of the fight that will ensue now. Again, Custer first deployed his men on foot, making great use of their repeating rifles. From the book Gettysburg by Alan Gelzo. Stuart tried to dislodge the stalemate with an aggressive mounted attack across the farm of John Rummel, which in turn was met by a furious saber swinging mounted counterattack by Custer and his Michigan cavalry. Custer at the head crying, Come on, you Wolverines! For an hour, the Rummel farm was turned into a smaller scale version of the cavalry scrum at Brandy Station a month before. Custer's Michigan Wolverines closed in on rebels and cut through their position and forced Wade Hampton uh, with sword cuts to the head and Jeb Stewart to retire from the field. This was an incredibly dramatic scene, and had Custer failed to stop Stewart and Hampton from getting into the rear of the Union position, the Gettysburg battle could have, have taken a very different turn. Now, after the Gettysburg Battle, Confederate Commander Robert E. Lee began his retreat out of Pennsylvania back to Virginia and had to cross the Potomac River to do so, which made him vulnerable to attack from the Federals. President Lincoln knew this and believed an aggressive attack could perhaps bag the entire Confederate Army, but Union Commander Meade decided against this because of the bad weather and because his Union Army was in really bad shape after the desperate fighting at Gettysburg. So Lee was allowed to cross the Potomac into Virginia at Falling Waters without much harassment. However, parts of the Union cavalry under General Kilpatrick, which included Custer's Michigan Brigade again, caught up to Lee's army uh, as they still had one division left north of the river as a rear guard, 
which was protected behind breastworks. Kilpatrick foolishly ordered a cavalry charge of 100 troopers from a regiment of the Michigan Brigade against an entrenched Confederate division, which was a recipe for suicide. Custer refused at first and told the men to dismount and approach on foot, but Kilpatrick insisted on a charge, which one lone regiment did, and they were cut to pieces. Leaders of the charge were killed, and 50 Union prisoners were taken. Kilpatrick, whose, name, whose nickname was Kill Cal- Cavalry, was much more rash than Custer. As we'll see in a moment, when Custer did lead cavalry charges, they tended to be well-timed and carefully planned, which is counter to the stereotype of the little bighorn. After Gettysburg, Custer was an instant celebrity. He became a household name and received lots of attention from the press. He was the image of a soldier every young man wanted to be, the idea of chivalric and romantic warfare. He was a walking recruitment poster for the Union Army. Custer was proving not to be the foolish or reckless stereotype we had, but instead was quite methodical in timing uh, of fights on foot versus mad cavalry charges. Now, Custer's wedding. Uh, After Custer's rise to fame and his promotion to Brigadier General of the Michigan Cavalry, Libby Bacon's father finally agreed to the marriage of the two, and they were wed in February of 1864. Libby was a highly educated, smart, and witty young lady, and was really more of a match for her husband in terms of wisdom and intelligence. After their wedding, Custer brought Libby to New York as part of their honeymoon and introduced her to his old hero, McClellan, and took her throughout the town to show her some of the sights. He also took her to Washington, D.C. and Capitol Hill, where he then left her in Washington to lobby for Senate approval of his appointment as Brigadier General. That important formality had not yet happened and was crucial to the continuance of his career. This she did very well while Custer was engaged in the Overland or Wilderness Campaign that we'll discuss in just a moment. She turned out to be a very adept at lobbying in Washington, uh, but was also, also found some of the senators and representatives to be quite licentious. This included Francis W. Kellogg of Michigan, who tried to physically corner her in a hotel room one night. But she was nimble and adept at fighting off men, so she was able to escape the incident with her dignity intact. Now, after Gettysburg, there were a few small fights, but none of them really stood out. But this was going to change very quickly when Ulysses S. Grant was promoted to lieutenant general and came east to take over all the Union armies because he brought with him a secret weapon in the name of Phil Sheridan. Now, just before the Overland Campaign, also known as the Wilderness Campaign, Grant uh, replaced Union Cavalry Commander Pleasanton with Phil Sheridan to take over all the Union Cavalry, and the commanders were initially unhappy with this. However, it turned out that Sheridan was infinitely more effective and aggressive than Pleasanton. Also, Custer found that he and Sheridan were cut from the same mold, and they ended up working quite well together for the remainder of the war and beyond. Okay, now we'll talk about Yellow Tavern. During the Overland Campaign, Sheridan convinced Grant to allow him to take on the Confederate cavalry with a major raid to tempt Jeb Stuart into a fight, which he did. At Yellow Tavern, Jeb Stuart had chosen the ground carefully on a concave line between two ridges and was really having his way with Sheridan's cavalry. The fight was going nowhere for Sheridan, But Custer came to him and proposed an attack on an artillery battery on Stuart's left flank. Stuart then gave him permission. Custer sent two regiments on foot and two on horseback while his band played Yankee Doodle. Quote, Custer's charge was brilliantly executed, Sheridan reported. Quote, first at a walk, then a trot, then dashing at the enemy's line and battery, unquote. Customer led the charge, hacking away with his sword, 
as they took Stuart's flank and won the battle, causing the rebels to flee in panic. During this time, one of Custer's men spotted General Stuart and shot him, and he soon died after this. Now, Stuart was one of the great Confederate commanders of the war, and his death was, for the Union, a stunning accomplishment, and for the Confederacy, a stunning loss. Quote, a blow to the Confederate leadership next only to the death of Stonewall Jackson a year later, or a year and one day earlier, unquote, wrote historian James McPherson. After this, Custer and Sherid- became Sheridan's favorite commander. And because of this, Custer would now play a lead role in most of the cavalry action for the remainder of the Overland campaign and also the Shenandoah Valley campaign. So next we'll talk about Trevilian Station. During the final leg of the Over- Overland campaign, Grant ordered Sheridan's cavalry to stage a raid deep into Virginia with the goal of destroying railroads and providing a diversion while he crossed the entire army over the James River. At Trevilian Station, customer came upon a massive wagon train belonging to Cavalry Commander uh, General Wade Hampton, who had taken over for uh, Stewart after his death. He made an error at this point, and he acted impulsively to, to immediately capture the wagon train with his brigade. However, he was suddenly or suddenly realized that his brigade was surrounded on three sides by three brigades of Hampton's Confederates. He formed up his men and improvised fortifications as the enemy pressed inward. Historian uh, Eric J. Wittenberg described this as, quote, Custer's first last stand, unquote. Custer was all over the place, moving artillery pieces to counter the most dangerous threats. He gathered his men to form a mounted reserve and countercharged when the rebels appeared to be breaking through. Again, luck was with Custer. He was hit by spent bullets twice, and a bullet grazed his scalp, stunning him briefly, uh, but he was largely unhurt. At this point, his flag bearer was killed, so he ripped the flag off the staff and shoved it into his uniform to prevent it from being captured. Finally, around midday, General Wesley Merritt broke the siege, and Custer's brigade was rescued. Sheridan arrived and asked Custer if the rebels had captured his headquarters flag. Quote, not by a damn sight, unquote, Custer replied, and reached into his uniform and pulled it out. Custer rallied and saved his troops, and what, from what could have been a disaster, it turned into a Union triumph. Wade Hampton's men were driven out of Trevilian Station, and Sheridan's cavalry scored a massive victory over the rebels. Again, the press raved over Custer, quote, the boy general with the golden locks, unquote, and he received even more fame with the American public. Now, the Third Battle of Winchester. During the siege of Petersburg, Virginia, Robert E. Lee detached an army under Confederate General Jubal Early to threaten Washington again. This created extreme tension in the North, and the Lincoln administration was unnerved by the presence of Early's army this close to Washington. One of Early's raids did actually reach the outskirts of Washington, causing terror in the city, and his efforts in the valley finally culminated in the Battle of Third Winchester. Now, uh, Jubal Early had formed his men into a formidable defensive position that was proving difficult for Sheridan to attack. Custer's cavalry unit was on the right flank. The fight was dragging on, and Sheridan ordered Custer to charge from his position. But the Confederates were behind a stone wall, and Custer knew that this would be a suicidal charge. So he got permission to watch and wait for an opening. After a while, he saw that the Confederates were repositioning themselves and believed that the time to charge had come. So he ordered the charge as they were moving away from the stone wall, one volley and over the top with Custer leading. He was an action hero, again from Custer's trials. One trooper saw Custer in the forefront, slashing with his saber. A rebel just a few feet away raised his rifle and aimed. Customer yanked hard on the reins. His horse reared on its hind legs, and the bullet missed. 
quote, Then a terrible sword stroke descends upon the infantryman's head, and he sinks to the ground a lifeless corpse, unquote, the witness recalled. This cavalry charge, timed and led by Custer, delivered the final blow that turned a drawn-out struggle into a crushing Union victory. This was the only time in the 18th century uh, recorded that a mounted charge was effective against infantry. And after this, Custer was, of course, promoted to division commander. Now the Battle of Cedar Creek. This battle was next for Custer, and this was the one that finally destroyed Jubal Early's Confederate army and cleared the Confederates out of the Shenandoah Valley for the duration of the war. We covered this dramatic engagement in part one of the series, which capped an extraordinary string of victories in which Custer played a central role. Already a Union hero, he emerged from the valley a national icon. Now let's go to Appomattox Courthouse. Custer's cavalry division again played a lead role at Five Forks, helping flank the Confederates out of Petersburg, and then in the mad Union dash to cut off Robert E. Lee's army at Appomattox Courthouse. In fact, it was his division that captured the trains at Appomattox Courthouse intended to feed Lee's army and then formed the final line that cornered the rebels and forced them to surrender. He received the flag of truce from the Army of Northern Virginia. Phil Sheridan felt so strongly about Custer's role in the capture of Lee's army that he brought the oval table from Wilmer McLean used by Grant to draft the surrender terms and gave this table to Custer as a gift. This table is now on display at the Smithsonian. Tune in for episode 8 in which we'll discuss Custer's life on the plains and his appointment with destiny in the Montana Territory. 